Hello, welcome to Tensile Ground Coffee, a few minutes on ground engineering to enjoy it while having your coffee. Well, you find me doing a little bit of finite element analysis. Can be a bit frustrating sometimes, but never mind. Um, so, continuing on with the Ask Andrew season. Um, oh, let's get rid of that for a minute. So, let's have a look at what uh, questions we've had in this week. Uh, yes, from Sandy, Sandy Gravel. And she asks, how do we model GeoGrid in finite element analysis? Well, uh, what an opportune moment to come and ask that question. So, um, yes, quite tricky, that one. Um, let's go over to the flip chart, Brian, and uh, I'll explain. So, uh, modeling GeoGrid in finite element analysis. There's a piece of uniaxial GeoGrid used in uh, slopes and uh, retaining walls. So um, we model it as what's called a membrane element, or sometimes just called a geogrid element. The properties of that are um, no bending stiffness, just like geogrid, and no compression stiffness, just tensile stiffness. That, that's all it has, tensile stiffness. And when you put it into a finite element analysis model, you can, um, you can put interface elements between the geogrid and the soil if you want. Uh, that may be appropriate for an ultimate limit state design where you want to actually check for pull out and sliding along here. But for serviceability limit state, where you're predicting deformations uh, in service, usually a uh, membrane element is not necessary. Because of the interlock that you get, the aggregate can actually go into the apertures here and you get quite good uh, resistance. Um, so normally not necessary to put membrane element, uh, interface elements between the geogrid uh, and the soil. Uh, the more tricky bit is actually what parameters are we going to use and what model are we going to use for the geogrid itself. Now remember it's modeled as a membrane element so we don't actually have the the apertures uh, and the ribs in it's just one uniform material so it um, it needs to take into account the sort of the overall stiffness properties. It may have anisotropic properties because um, you see we get very different stiffness in that direction to in this direction. Um, so um, that's something to consider. But what we're going to look at are the different models uh, and the ways to model this, uh, this uh, tensile behavior here. So let's put that over there. Um, now uh, the stiffness of uh, GeoGrid depends really on four main uh, factors. That is the uh, the product itself, so that's what polymer it's made of, the geometry of the geogrid, the quality of it, they all affect um, the stiffness. Uh, we also have the load level. So most polymers do not have a linear uh, elasticity. Depending on the load level, their, uh, their stiffness will actually vary. We have the temperature. So polymers will have different stiffnesses at different temperatures. And um, what's the other one? Load level, temperature, uh, product. Ah, duration of loading. So a polymer will creep a little bit uh, over time. So you'll get a slightly higher stiffness in the short term, and then over time that will reduce. So it's the uh, load duration. So somehow you need to take all that into account in the way that you, uh, that you model the stiffness. So let's look at the, um, the most uh, basic way of uh, modeling um, the stiffness. So let's draw a graph of the, uh, the tensile load against the tensile strain and we'll represent uh, the behavior that way. So this is linear elastic. So you will get a straight line like that. So that's just one EA value. So the stiffness is expressed as an EA value, which formally means the Young's modulus multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the geogrid. But that does not mean that we calculate the Young's modulus of the polymer and the cross-sectional area of the geogrid, because the geometry of the geogrid varies uh, as you go along. You see here it's fairly narrow along the ribs and then when we get to um, 
to the transverse bar here, the geometry completely changes. So it's difficult to, to know what section or area to take. So we take the average properties from stiffness testing on um, larger um, samples of the geogrid. So we never break it down to individual E and A values. It's just expressed as an overall average EA. So when you're doing a linear elastic model, you need to choose one EA value that takes into account the product characteristics, the load level, the temperature, and the load duration. So it's actually quite difficult to find one value that's going to be correct for all of those. But it's very good, uh, it's very easy to use and good as an initial um, uh, estimate of your behavior. So you can start off with something simple like that just to get an analysis going. That's load, that's strain, just like that one. Option number two, linear elastic again, but we have a limit on the load level here, and we have then perfect plasticity. So it cannot take any more load than that. So it will continue to strain at the same load. So that is linear elastic, perfectly plastic. So um, again, it's just one EA value that needs to take into account all of these, but you can put a limit on the load. So this might be good for an ultimate limit state design, where you're checking the um, where the strength of the geogrid may become important. But certainly in serviceability limit state analyses, um, it's unlikely that the force in the grid will get up to um, a, a rupture load. But it's there, particularly for ultimate limit state methods if you want it. Um, next one. Load, strain. Uh, let's let's make this one the viscoelastic model. So we have a certain EA value again that's a straight line so it's the same for all the geogrid. Let's uh, just write that viscoelastic. Let's write this one out. Viscoelastic. That means it varies with time so it takes into account the load duration. It does not take into account count changes in the load because it's one EA value. With all of these you that there isn't a commonly used method that takes into account changes in temperature so you assume that you've got one temperature during the life of the structure, one design temperature. So all of these are appropriate for the temperature and they're all appropriate for the product. With viscoelastic it will change with time so as time goes by the EA value will um, slowly reduce. So we'll get a lower EA value. I've exaggerated the change there, it's not that big, but that's what happens as time progresses. So this is the only one that's going to take into account changes in stiffness due to the load duration. So you could have a certain stiffness at construction and then in the long term the stiffness will actually reduce. Now only the viscoelastic of these three will take that into account. If you simply changed, if you reduce the stiffness from one stage to the next using linear elasticity, it will not take into account that uh, the effect of that change in stiffness. Something important about uh, FEA is uh, just, just doing that is not going to have any effect. You, to take that into account, you must use uh, viscoelastic. Last one, uh, this is my favorite, the one I use the most is um, it's just a non-linear elastic model, non-linear elastic. So that's load and that's strain again. Instead of it being linear, we can now put in a curve. Like that. So it will not take into account changes over time, but if you're interested in something at construction or in the long term, then you can select the appropriate curve. It's called an isochronous curve because it's appropriate for that particular load duration. Uh, the good thing about this is it takes into account changes in load, also changes in the load along the length of the geogrid. It's very unusual to get a, a constant load all the way along the geogrid, so this will give you the different stiffness levels along the geogrid and also at different uh, levels where the geogrid occurs. So it will be appropriate for the product, 
you need to select it for the right design temperature level. It automatically accounts for the change in load level, the change in stiffness here, the slope changes with the load level. Uh, the only thing it will not take into account is changes in the load duration. So you just need to select it for the right uh, duration. That's why it's called isochronous curve. Okay, so there you go. A quick overview of how to model um, GeoGrid in finite element analysis. If you want the properties that go into these models, you need to contact the manufacturer of that particular GeoGrid. Okay, that's all for this episode of Tensile Ground Coffee. Thanks for watching and see you next time.